Her name's Liz Lowe. Oh, thank you. Right, recording in progress. Right. Uh, good evening. I'm Liz Lawrence. I've been asked to chair this. Um, so, first of all, welcome very much. I hope everyone finds it enjoyable and interesting meeting. Um, first of all, I'm going to hand over to Terry Conway, who's going to deal with a few of the housekeeping arrangements. And then I'll say a bit about the speakers, and then we'll start in a few minutes with the speakers. Right. So, Terry, over to you, please. Thanks, Liz. And first of all, as you can see, we're recording the meeting. If anybody doesn't want to be on, have their name recorded, stick a note in the chat and we'll make sure you're not in any of the shots. Um, I'm not sure whether we'll keep the discussion, but we'll certainly record and put the speakers on our website while the speakers are speaking, we'd ask you not to use the chat because it can be distracting for the speakers. When we've heard from the speakers, there'll be time for questions and contributions from the floor. If you can, please raise your electronic hands because it makes it easier for the chair to see what order people have indicated in. Please keep to time when the chair tells you to end. Please don't say, and just one more thing three times. Um, if you can't use your electronic hands, you can wave, um, but it's easier if you can use them. Um, and if you have any announcements that you want made, please pass them either to me or to Liz in the chat and we'll make sure that they're made at the end of the meeting. I think that's it for now. Right. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, it's always helpful to have these things clarified at the beginning. Right. So if I can say welcome and just make a few preliminary sort of comments. Um, So good evening and welcome to this book launch organised by Resistance Books. Resistance Books is a feminist, internationalist and eco-socialist publisher. Uh, details of our publications can be found on the Resistance Books, Books website. Um, and we can post the details of that in the chat later. We're very pleased to welcome our two speakers this evening to talk about internationalism or Russification, a study in the Soviet nationalities problem. The issues debated in this book are important for understanding the history of Ukraine and for understanding the present day situation. Our first speaker is Bodan Krauchenko. He is the former director of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies of the University of Alberta and wrote an introduction to one of the first editions of the book. He's also the author of Social Change and National Consciousness in 20th Century Ukraine, which takes a historical and political economy approach to the question. And that book is available on the internet, a PDF can be found, and we will post the link for that later. Our second speaker is Yaroslav Kabalchuk. He is an editor of Commons, the Ukrainian left journal, which I would recommend to everybody to look at regularly. He's a PhD student specialising in the Soviet history of Western Ukraine. Our first speaker will address the context. Um, he's going to talk about the history, particularly perhaps mentioning the cultural division of labour that existed and the idea of Ukraine as an internal colony. And these are the issues that are addressed in the book uh, we are discussing this evening. Yaroslav will focus on the latter reception of Juba's work and its importance. Each speaker will speak for around 15 minutes and then we'll have questions and discussion. I'll probably try and group the questions in two or threes if that works. At the end of the meeting, I'll call on Fred Laplatte, Chair of Ukraine Solidarity Campaign, to speak about the work of USC. And... I've also been told to say the next book launched by Resistance Books is on the Wednesday, the 9th of October. And we'll be looking at a book, Palestine and Marxism by Joseph Deha, which is, I'm reading at the moment, it's very interesting and very useful. It costs around 10, I think costs 10 pounds. So um, that's the point about introductions. So can I say welcome to everyone? And um, we, we've got 27 people here now. People are still coming in. That's really good. So um, it's Pleasant to see so many people here this evening. So, can I invite our first speaker, Bodan, to speak? Uh, thank you. Let me unmute myself. Oops. Oops. Oh, dear. No, I think you are muted. I heard you. Yeah. You heard me? 
Yes, we can hear you fine. So okay, go, well, go for it. Okay. Well, uh, I appreciate this opportunity to speak about uh, Zuba's work. Uh, although I'm, uh, and to really thank uh, Resistance Books for publishing the book. Um, uh, this is 12 o'clock. I'm jet lagged from Canada. So if I am less than coherent, which I probably will be, I apologize in advance. And I, uh, I, I quickly wrote my notes for this, uh, this talk. And I hope I don't exceed the 15 minute uh, 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 allotment. So please let me know when I have to end about five minutes before. Um, let me begin by saying something about Zuba as a person uh, and his role in Ukraine after ach achieving in the after the country achieved that independence in August 91. I moved to Ukraine in January 91, and over the years got to know. Uh, Zuba quite well through working on various initiatives. He was a very soft-spoken, modest, and very decent person. He was a founding member of Ruch, the uh, mass movement that was instrumental in the struggle for Ukraine's independence and, dem and a democratic Ukraine. He was editor of Ukraine's best intellectual journal, and he was also minister of culture, but he was and too embarrassed to use the chauffeur-driven car allotted to him, so he used public transport, much to the amazement of his staff. As a leading literary critic, he supported young scholars and writers who unshackled literature from the constraint of so-called socialist realism, who wrote about feminism and novels that reflected in innovative ways actual social conditions, and not all novels had a happy ending. Lina Kosten Kostenko, one of Ukraine's greatest poetess, poets, said at his funeral, Ivan Zuba, this is a person who always had the courage to speak the truth. It was this, in, in, this essential integrity that moved him to go to Babenyar in September 1996 on the 25th anniversary of the massacre, where a large cloud, crowd assembled spontaneously stood silently wanting to hear someone say something, and Juba spoke. His speech is reproduced in the book. His condemnation of anti-Semitism, I think, was a milestone in building a political nation. Juba was born in Donetsk uh, Oblast, Volnovsky Rayon, now under Russian occupation. The district capital, Volnovakha, was leveled to the ground. The district was the scene of horrific war crimes, including the massacre of a family of nine. Zuba died on February 22nd, not 2022, two days before the start of the war. He was spare, spared the agony that followed. But his origins in industrial Donbass region heavily reflected they were heavily affected, were a region heavily affected by Russification policies deepened his awareness of these issues. It is, it is quite interesting that some of Ukraine's greatest literary figures and prominent dissidents emerged from the Donbas cauldron. For example, Serhi Jadan, poet, novelist, social activist with rock, far, rock star status. His novels are available in English and the poetess Lyubov Yakimchuk, one of the f most influential figures in the cultural scene. And there were poets and writers under the USSR who suffered years of imprisonment for their dissent. Um, somebody familiar with Ukraine will know the names of Ivan Stus, Vasil Stus, Ivan Svitlichny, Mikola Vodenko, Alexa Tehe. Ukrainians formed a disproportionate proportion of political prisoners, over 60%. They said that if in Moscow for dissent they clip your fingers, in Ukraine they cut your arm off, and the Ukrainians receive the longest possible sentences. I think that one of the most I want to I essentially want to give historical background um, to to frame to frame the question of Ukraine's status as a colony. But I think it's there's a something that Zuba said in, in the title of in chapter 13 that I think is extremely important, especially for the left. 
where he said that national problems are always social problems and problems of political class strategy. National problems have bearing on democracy, on the rights and liberties of individuals. For the left, histor the left historically has not done well on the national question. At the first international, the French delegation said, uh, nations will disappear, let's focus on social issue. Marx ironically said, well, this was said by the French delegate in French, and uh, nobody in the room could understand it. So nations and the national question won't disappear. I think for people on the left, support on national rights, uh, the right of people to determine their own fate, the, the development of national culture, is 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 where the train begins. But it doesn't end at this stop. For people on the left, it carries forward to construct a socially equitable society and other measures. The development of national identity uh, requires infrastructure, schools, schools, media, research, higher education. This is generally led by elites who have chosen not to become a comprador elite. Elites who, uh, who unlike those who cooperate with external authorities, and assimilate into an alien cultures. Some elites demand recognition of the group as a nation as a whole, and this means advancing, advancing uh, cultural distinctiveness, the under, and, and, and also underpinning it is the control for the nation's resources and opportunities. When we mean by elites, I mean leading groups, and Ukraine's problem, unlike in Central Europe, was that its, its elites, the leading group, was constantly destroyed. For the longest time, it was only the intelligentsia broadly understood as the thinking class, uh, the thinking class that led the process of building national identity. And the only force that they could rely on was their people, the thinking peasants and workers. People are still reluctant to speak about Russia as a colonial power. Colonies are supposed to be overseas. Russia absorbed lands formed by contiguous territory, conquering people totally different, uh, uh, with totally different languages and social formations. Russia justified this for, centu for centuries as the gathering of historic lands and invented historiographies for this purpose. So take Kyrgyzstan, for example, that was conquered by the by Imperial Russia in the mid 19th century. And like all Russian, uh, all Central Asian nationals, they were classified as foreigners under uh, under Russia and deprived of rights. Soviet historiography called this the re uh, reunification of lands, not conquest. At the core of the Russian idea is empire and expansion. Deep in Russian consciousness, consciousness is not the idea of developing your society economically, socially, for the benefit of your people. Often said by Russians, there is no, no Russian idea other than empire. And I think Putin is a very good uh, example of this. The national question is a social question. How it was posed before the revolution and after is something I want to talk about a bit. The first I think is very important to discuss the social formation that Russia represents, the basic principles of which have not changed for centuries. Russia's rise to statehood started under the Mongols. The Mongols did not occupy land they stayed in the steppe and used Russian princes to collect taxes. The beneficiary here was the wily Ivan I, known as Ivan Kalita, or money banks. When the population of Tver rose against the Mongols, he headed a combined Moscow-Mongol punitive force in raising the city to the ground. For this, he received the Yarlik from the Khan, a monopoly to collect taxes and tribute throughout Russia. 
Moscow accumulated great wealth because it was exempt from taxes. The Hans granted him horrific, honorific titles. It also adopted many Mongol financial, administrative, and governance features. Using this monopoly, he organized foreclosures, lending uh, because the cities, the, the, the principalities could not pay the high taxes, and Muscovy absorbed neighboring principalities and expanded territory. After that, Mus Muscovy grew by conquest, but that required a different political, a political social economic order. And it was Ivan III, the great, the gatherer of lands and the founder of Russian statehood that began establishing a new, a new uh, social order that started with changing of land tenure that had profound consequences. Under his rule, there was no private land. Landed estates were, uh, were, were, were turned into another type of tenure. It was called the Pomestia, whose holder had to give lifelong service to the Tsar. Uh, and the landlords who did not satisfy the crown had the land confiscated and given someone more compliant. And he introduced the first elements of serfdom. Com compulsory service to the state was a pillar of the Mos Moscovite patrimonial state that provided the means to have a, com a comparatively well-organized army. Ar uh, Ivan III also uh, established state armaments factories employing Italian specialists. The state became fit for further conquest. But first they had to destroy Novgor the Novgorodian Republic. It was a very different social formation. It was a Republican system of government similar to Scandinavian countries had prosperous trade manufacturing as linked to the Hanseatic lead, and its army was a citizen's army. They didn't stand a chance, and the conquest of, of, uh, of, of Novgorod was a turning point in Russian history. It sealed any chance of Russia's development except along the autocratic pathway. Ivan IV, the terrible, perfected the notion of Tsar as sovereign, with unrestrained personal authority and developed a centralized bureaucracy to enhance, enhance control. He expanded the army, but both the apparatus and the military income was derived from land allocated to them. But they paid little attention to improving the land because their, their income, their, their allotment was based, their advancement was based on service to a higher, was, was based on service, and if you performed well, you were given the biggest estate. You considered it only as a, only as a, as a source of income. You had no incentive to particularly improve the land you were on. The peasantry carried the burden, and to ensure they didn't escape or brighter shores, serfdom became stricter and no, with no right to leave. This patro, this patrimonial, patrimonial system, there was nothing comparable like it in the West, where feudalism entailed private landed property with individual rights. The Pomestia system, patrimonial system, meant this landholding system, meant that the landholding class did not see their estates as private property, rather as fixed, fixed income, as I said, and showed little concern about agricultural improvement. There was no improvement in agricultural productivity between the 15th and 19th century. With only a quarter of Russian lands fit for agriculture, available land diminished as the number of uh, servitors grew. Well, you had to get more land and hence the further conquest, the conquest of Kazan, etc. As the burden on peasants grew, there were peasant rebellions and these were brutally put down. Peter the Great improved the system. He created a table of ranks, a bureaucracy, and to pay for it, he established state monopolies on all important industries, 
He 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 even taxed Russian cultural customs such as ba bathing, fishing, and wearing beards, and had a poll tax on peasants. Under Peter, he deepened the subjugation of of the peasants to uh, the landowners. Uh, serfdom became more vicious. His window to the to Europe with his wonderful palaces in Petersburg was paid by taxing the, uh, the peasants extensively. So Russia as a state was a, uh, was a, was a state, as I mentioned, uh, was a patro pat patronomial and service-oriented state where the state controlled the economy, if not outright ownership, with had a very strong bureaucracy. That was the Russian state that confronted and conquered Ukraine. That was a very different social formation. Following the Khmelnytsky uprising of 1648, the uprising against uh, Poland, which was led by the peasants, um, serfdom was very close to being abolished. The 17th century was a time of relative prosperity. Trade with the West, with Western Europe flourished. Critical was that towns were autonomous. You had guilds, you had a growth of artisans, workers, shopkeepers, and a strong merchant class. This group supported schools and a woman endowed Kiev Mohila Academy, the first higher education institution in the Slavic world you had relatively vibrant intellectual and cultural life. All that changed when Ukraine became under Russian imperial control, especially after the Battle of Poltava in 1709. Ukraine found itself in the grip of Russia that was entering on a path of very aggressive mer mercantilism, which meant a strong centralized government to control the economy, wealth accumulation, trade balance, and colonial expansion. This was Peter's legacy. Ukraine's autonomy was reduced to a minimum. The country was left economically defenseless. Ukraine was treated as a foreign hostile state. Trade was placed in the hands of the Russians, uh, Russian state commerce, uh, Russian state enterprises, um, which proceeded to ruin trade because they didn't, didn't know how to do it. And the axe fell on Ukrainian manufacturing. It was close to make Ukraine a market for goods from Russia. And the city autonomy was abolished, and Russians were given an incentive to settle in Ukrainian towns. Any Russian artisan or, or shop or, or, or business person of any sort was given many years tax exemption to open up, uh, open up business in Ukraine. The cities changed the national composition as the Ukrainian artisans left for the, the countryside because they could not compete with Russia. A particular catastrophe was the reintroduction of serfdom in Ukraine under Russia, especially under Catherine, the so-called Great. And it was a reintroduction of serfdom in its most severe form. In Russia itself, the form of serfdom payment was quit rent. You paid a proportion of, of uh, say, 10% of your harvest. Since 10% of a lousy harvest was not particularly a good deal, landlords told, sent many of the peasants to go work in towns and, uh, and, uh, and in, in whatever other opportunities, because 10% of, uh, of that income was much, much better than 10% of what they would get from land. The result is that uh, Russians had an experience of working in towns, working in, with some industries, unlike Ukrainians, where the peasants had to pay their dues in corvée, and that is extensive land labor. And this is, this is the curse of having good soil. Because the soil was very good, it was in the interest of the landowners to have as much of the land as possible, and, and, the, and have the peasants work as long on the land as they possibly can. And so Ukrainians had very little opportunity to, of any kind of urban or non-farm experience and were uncompetitive when it came to entering into industry later on. Besides, their plots were extremely small. 
when the emancipation of serfs occurred in 1890, uh, 1863, the allotment of land given to peasants in Ukraine was much smaller than in Russia, simply because the land was so uh, so valuable. The landowners were brought in en masse by Catherine. And by the end of the 19th century, three quarters of all landlords were Russian, which of course added a strong national dimension to the issue of agrarian reform. Under the Tsars, there was no education to speak of. Two thirds of the children of Ukraine never set foot in a classroom. Per capita expenditure on education was the lowest in the world. And in Ukraine, you had mass, uh, mass illiteracy. Ukraine was probably unique in that literacy in the 17th century was higher than in the 19th century. Only 18, only 13% of Ukrainians were literate in 1897. Following the, uh, the, the Kirill Methodius Brotherhood incident, this was a small group, Shevchenko was a member of this, uh, the, the Russian uh, authorities panicked and began a ban on Ukrainian language publishing so that the, the people like Shevchenko could not communicate with their people. And also in the mid 19th century under Alexander III, there was a bit of relaxation and you saw the emergence of a small Ukrainian, Ukrainian movement. This scared the Russian authorities and in 1863, they introduced a draconian law banning the Ukrainian language. No books in Ukrainian were, were, were allowed. The, Ukraine, the Bible in Ukrainian was banned while Karl Marx was published in Russian. No Ukrainian theater was allowed, and even libretti to music could not be published in Ukrainian. As the official said at that time, Ukraine was not, is not, and will not be. And by the way, that has been repeated by some of Putin's guys. Things changed in Ukraine because of the First World War, where thousands, millions of Ukrainians were recruited to fight on the front. And so peasants that had never left their village for the first time saw a different world. And national consciousness um, is very much influenced by the experience of contrast. What an important ingredient of the story was that Ukrainians were not allowed by and large to be officers, but they could be lowly lieutenants and sergeants. And hence they were in close contact with Ukrainian troops and on the front in the, in the trenches occurred much discussion and prepared a massive cater of people for when the revolution happened. When they returned back to home, you had a massive peasant revolution in 1917 with the returning soldiers playing a leading role. And by the end of 1917 revolution, land had been more or less distributed uh, in Ukraine. The agrarian revolution was more or less done by Ukrainians. Can you wind up soon, please? Pardon? Uh, can you draw your remarks to conclusion sooner. Uh, just okay. get this I, I, fascinating, I, I, but and I know there's masses of material, but okay, so let me let me uh let 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 me get uh, let me get so just very very quickly. Uh when when the Bolsheviks finally took power in in 1919 uh, this was under war communism, and they introduced collectivization. There was a very big peasant uh, rebellion. And Ukrainization, that Zuba talks about very much, is the product, is a concession that was given to the Ukrainian peasant movement, and it achieved very, very significant, very significant success uh, under, under NEP. Uh, you had a uh, 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 a tremendous growth in education and literacy. 
the Ukrainians had incredibly high rates of literacy by the 20s. Let me go to the, uh, let, let me, uh, but this is, of course was a time when, th this was a time while you had social mobility and uh, that is uh, U Ukrainians were moving into industry and all of that. But this was the time of the Holodomor, the mass famine where millions of Ukrainians died and also mass purges were that liquidated two thirds of intellectuals. But by the end of this period, the majority of the working class is Ukrainian and the majority of towns are Ukrainian. So let's get to the, let's get quickly to the 1960s when you have a new generation emerging. The majority of the party are Ukrainians and having been trained for, for leadership, they want to exercise it. But 80% of industry is controlled uh, are, is controlled by Moscow directly, so-called un, all union jurisdiction. There was a colossal drain of capital. 50% of capital formed in Ukraine was reinvested outside, uh, outside the Republic. And there was a, there was many, many com complaints uh, about this. But with Khrushchev's, with Khrushchev's thought in the 1960s, and this is the period of Zuba, one could become bolder and speak out and make demands about more Ukrainian language books and newspapers. The Ukrainian language, as Duba uh, has pointed out, was often portrayed and is portrayed as the language of the lower strata. And he talks about the uh, about uh, about this social the social question extremely well. The big factor here was the russification of higher education which block the road to social mobility in the USSR. Ukrainians, more than anybody else in the Soviet Union, completed secondary school and though were eligible for higher education. But because higher education was russified and they didn't, they could not get into higher education, there was a disproportionate number of people who were, who were Russian. And so there was a lot of frustration over, I've been, I, I had my ambition to get to university, but I couldn't pass the Russian entrance exam. The other thing that happened is that since 80% of all enterprises were under all union, uh, all union jurisdiction, the factory directors couldn't care less about recruiting nationals. So it, they, they, they were quite willing to give jobs to Russia. There was also a very big problem with job allocation. Don't forget that until 1976, peasants did not have an internal passport. That it means they could not leave to go to the, to go to cities without the permission of the local uh, party committee. And this was a colossal, and since the majority of Ukrainians lived in agriculture, this was an enormous blockage uh, to their mobility. The other thing that happened was that under, if you completed higher education, the system was uh, called Ordnabov. The, 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 you were directed to your first job. If you were Ukrainian, you were disproportionately directed to work in the villages and not to work in good jobs in the countryside. Um, but russification was theorized by, by something called the merging of the people, a process, uh, a, a process, a, a process whereby eventually all the nations are going to merge. And obviously this means that they're all going to merge within a, a Russian world and, 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 and therefore russification was really a step to the so-called peaceful mer mer uh, merger of, uh, of people. I must say that's a really fascinating point. Perhaps if you could sort of conclude around that point and then people can come back with other questions because I'm sure people have got a lot of things to just, ask you as well. Just, just let me finish this one, this one point. I said um, the point about russification was I will learn Russian and you will learn you will learn to love your Russian boss. But that didn't work because 
you could know, you could read all the Pushkin you want in the world, but if your economy is blocked and your social mobility is blocked, you are not going to uh, forget it. In any case, I think that uh, the 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 Tsarist the Tsarist legacy and the 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 the, the, the current system that you have the current system in uh, in, in, in Putin's Russia is a, is a social formation that Ukraine wants no part of, and uh, the Ukraine's independence is a rejection also of that social formation. Now that Ukraine is independent, fighting for its independence, there is going to be a longer-term process of decolonization, but we'll leave that for another time. That's it. Sorry. Thank you very much. It's fascinating. It's just so much material, isn't there, to talk about? No, sorry. I, very good. Very interesting. <laughs> can I can I invite our next speaker, Yaroslav, to come in now? And then after we have both speakers, we'll have some questions and discussion. Right. So I've been spotlighted so you can see me as well. It's live for you. Okay. Right. Yaroslav, would you like to start too? Okay. Um um just a disclaimer because my take a bit will be a bit more critical on Zuba and how he actually partially um divorced social and national question is his later framing of the book but i'll just want to say that i have a huge respect uh for Zuba for this book in particular and uh for all of his activities but I just want to start with my um, personal story, how I first learned about uh, Ivan Zuba and his book. I was 16 years old uh, in my last year in high school. And at our history of Ukraine class, we had a class on uh, dissidents. And that was presented as one of the major readings. But as the narrative in our textbooks was framed that any Ukrainian activist was already critical. So Zuba fit like just another guy who was critical about Russia, member of national movement. It didn't present him as a current of uh, leftist thought or something coming out of like Soviet ideology. It's just a person who clearly deviated from the mainstream, questioned it, but it was somehow omitted or downplayed that he used uh, Lenin's argument. So Duba didn't bring a bell for me as somebody, as an interesting uh, thinker. And uh, guys like from Ukrainian uh, revolution, like Rushevsky or Nestor Makhno were more role models for me uh, than Duba. Later, like maybe around 10 years later, when I... Um, actually read the text, it kind of uh, put me on a bit different trajectory than it put Duba. I rediscovered for myself early Soviet period and the promises that the Soviet project had, although we can discuss if Lenin truly believed in the national liberation and what and the equality of nation in the Soviet Union or not, but at least the promise and what people believed in uh, kind of struck me. But what I want to say that was not a coincidence that Zuba was framed in that way, that more leftist critical part of his thinking was omitted. Because Zuba himself, in the publications of his book that happened throughout the 90s and 2000s, uh, framed his book that it kind of departed from this critical leftist take. So what I want to do in my very brief speech, just look at three publications, three editions that were published in Ukraine and how Zuba himself framed it that affected the later reception. So there was three publications in Ukraine in 1990, when it's still the Soviet Union, in 1998. Uh, and the last one, and since then we didn't have any new publication of this book, so... People in the West are lucky to have uh, uh, newer editions. It was 2005, the last time the book was published in Ukraine. And to each 
uh, the publication Zuba wrote uh, forward or afterward. So the first publication in 1990, it happened in the Soviet journal, official journal of the Chizna, um, Fatherland. Uh, and that was a pivotal moment in the history of the Soviet Union and Soviet Ukraine. It was a late stage of perestroika. Soviet Union uh, hasn't collapsed yet. And uh, it was right before the first, um, uh, like, the free elections, like, no, after, like, yeah, around the first free elections in the Soviet Union. And Duba used the publication of the Russificate, like, uh, of internationalism or Russification as a moment for agitation for the, mo like, social movement, which Bogdan briefly mentioned, like, uh, uh, national movement, Narodny Ruch, uh, where, for which he kind of provided the framework of his work. He said that he no longer idealized Lenin as in the 60s for obvious reasons, because Lenin in late perestroika was uh, allowed to be criticized and people learned the darker pages. But he still considered Lenin's thought quite important against Russian chauvinism. And Parallel to national uh, liberation movements that uh, were rising in the national republics in the Soviet Union, there was also the rise of Russian nationalism and parts of Russian even imperialism at that moment. So it all happened simultaneously. And Zuba actually found that although he thought that his book uh, written in the context of 60s was a bit outdated, it at least... Uh, presented a certain dynamic in the core of the problem that how the Russification worked in the Soviet Union. Um, so he finished his afterword uh, in which he explained the context, how the book came to be and uh, the later repression that he faced uh, because of it. He called for um, Ukrainian national sovereignty the idea was for him that Ukrainians should decide, not Moscow, something that also Bogdan Kravchenko mentioned before me, that for um, Ukra Ukrainian um, intellectuals at that moment, that was like a common sense that um, not the center in Repub not the center in Moscow, but the center in Republic should control like, the major industries. And the capital should stay in Ukraine, and Ukrainians should take the matters in their hand. So that was the political agenda of the 1990s. Uh, plus, he added it to the cultural matters that more newspapers, more books should be published in Ukrainian. So he reiterated that point. Uh, I think that um, the problem was, and something that uh, Duba himself later regretted in the later interviews, that um, Narod Naruch uh, didn't have a proper social program. They mostly talked about culture, about sovereignty, but they didn't have something that they can put against uh, already brewing at that time, but still not implemented uh, neoliberal policies that happened in uh, most of the post-Soviet countries in the 90s. And he was uh, adamantly focused on the matters of culture, of uh, Ukrainian language, and he kind of didn't see that. So something that uh, I think he realized that was the problem, but uh, he joined not the Ukrainian leftist movement in the 90s, but so-called national democratic movement that uh, was mostly focused on the matters of culture, Ukrainian language. Um, in his second edition of the book that was finally published in Independent Ukraine in 1998, Duba uh, tried to bring some of the socioeconomic critique, but he only added the few first paragraphs to his foreword to the new edition of the book. He talks that if in the Soviet times it was a uh, Russian is the language of the communism. It changed in 1990s and with the arrival of, uh, as I said, market neoliberal reforms, it became the language of uh, commerce or businessmen. 
as he put it. So, but he actually didn't develop that point how social change in the market relations are connected with culture, still focusing on the matters of that moment, which was late 90s. And since I would say middle or even first half of the 90s, was a big debate in Ukraine what kind of status Russian language should have in Ukraine. Because officially Ukrainian was the only language, like the only official state language. So the, all the bureaucrats should speak Ukrainian, and that was kind of official Ukrainian language. But the majority of urban population, especially in southern and eastern Ukraine, in homeland of Duba, Donbass, spoke Russian. And that was a problem. So what do we do with Russia? So Duba was quite against the official status of the Russian language in Ukraine. He saw it as a um, like, lap, like outcome of the Russification and should be overcame and changed. So, so Ukrainians should go naturally back to their uh, U U Ukrainian language. But as I wanted to reiterate, Duba wasn't ethno-nationalist in no way. He believed in Ukrainian political nation where per person, regardless of their nationality, uh, their national rights were uh, preserved and guaranteed. But that was a political moment toward which Duba oriented his book. He used this 1998 edition. And as I said, it kind of misses the opportunity to rise a more deeper question about uh, you change like capitalist changes in, in Ukraine in the 90s. And um, the third edition of the book was published in uh, 2005. It was right after the Orange Revolution, where um, many national Democrats, to which uh, Ivan Duba belonged, uh, felt quite enthusiastic that uh, democratic grassroots movement can resist an authoritarian uh, attempt in their in their uh, home country. So even the policies of Russification or kind of state neglecting uh, any cultural policies could be uh, reversed and Ukrainian state could care more about the culture. So in his very brief, unlike the two previous publications where he had long articles uh, partially explaining the context of the book, partially uh, kind of laying out his political program and connecting the, uh, the international Russification to the political agenda. In 2005, he just uh, wrote more less than two pages uh, preface in which he said that uh, now, he is quite skeptical about the prospects of Ukrainian language and culture, but maybe there is a hope and there is like activists, those people who may change the state of affairs at that, that time. And actually, uh, after the Orange Revolution, there was uh, a minor boost in uh, Ukra in Ukrainian uh, publishing and uh, in um, what was major debate at that time um, that films uh, in Ukraine uh, like throughout the whole 90s and uh, first half of 2000s were dubbed in Russian. Uh, but for Duba, it was like a victory that they were dubbed now in Ukraine. So it's kind of cultural victory. But what I want to emphasize with all of his framing of his book, he narrowed down it to this cultural question kind of slowly omitting the social question, which, which was also at the core of his book. And I think that's kind of problem that's uh, like that's many people like on the left see with this book, this like I'm alone. But despite uh, this more mainstream interpretation, which Duba helped to establish, there are still U Ukrainian leftists who try to dig out leftist parts of Duba thought. Although, as I said, he slowly drifted in, into a so-called national democratic camp, which, like I said, mostly focused on cultural question of sovereignty, maybe international politics, but not that much on the social question, question of uh, labor of the working class people. 
And uh, in the most recent publication of and translation of the book into French and Spanish, one of the Ukrainian leftist and activist and publicist, Vladislav Starodubtsev, also wrote a preface, which actually framed it more into a left leaning way rather than Duba himself framed it in publication inside the Ukraine, showing that Duba's thought had left it like critical underleanings um, that, uh, for example, not only it's necessarily about internationalism or Russification, but his later writings, he questioned globalization, as I said, and the market relations that came to Ukraine. He didn't provide any kind of solu solution or, like, I don't know, program as a politician, he was no longer a politician in 2000s when he wrote about those stuff. But there are kind of remnants of the leftist thought there. And if we are taking it in the progress, there is more into Duba to discover. So, yeah, like I would say that uh, despite of decades of uh, neoliberal hegemony in Ukraine, people on the left are digging and searching uh, Duba's literary and intellectual legacy. And uh, maybe we will have the fourth edition of uh, internationalism or Russification, which frames it in a more critical uh, towards capitalism and how like, Ukrainian cult and imperialism, how Ukrainian culture was oppressed and how it's interconnected between socioeconomic formation and the culture. So yes, that's, uh, yeah, hope. Yeah, I managed to finish in 15 minutes, but yeah, maybe I was also a bit convol convoluted because it's quite late and my brain doesn't operate that well at this time. Thank you very much. Can I say thank you very much? And thank you very much to both our speakers for the fact that you're both speaking at us, which are not perhaps brilliant times for you. I realize there is this time difference, which adds to the factor of everything. Right. Can I have indications, please, of, if you could preferably raise your electronic hand to indicate if you'd like to speak, or ask a question or a point of discussion? Any questions, discussions? Um, right, I, I, I've seen two. Let's take Travis and then Andrew, and then um, then we'll, right with Travis over to you. Then please. Hi. Um, I was curious. I, I'm trying to remember how to pronounce. Uh, how do you, how do you pronounce the, the, the Duras? The guy, the the original guy we're talking about. I'm just trying to remember the pronunciation. Sumpia. Sumpia. Um, I was interested. There was a figure who, I guess, he was the Communist Party secretary during his time. A guy named um, Vladimir Sitch or Bitsky, and I guess his whole legacy is the fact that he sort of enforced, despite being Ukrainian, enforced this whole philosophy of Russification, that Russian was the na the um, the language of the revolution. We need to be grateful to great Russia, to Lenin. And I guess I'm just trying to make sense of um, maybe, I don't know if it's within the scope of uh, this meeting, I guess, I guess the psychology of that, of being able, of growing up in a country that sort of very much um, under the thumb of uh, Russia. Of course, you're getting all this power, but at the same time, this almost like, like he was, most of his program was to suppress Ukrainian language. Uh, like, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to make sense of the psychology of, uh, I guess, classes who, despite being Ukrainian, would work so hard to um, suppress it. 
Thanks for that. It's an interesting point. Right, I've got two Andrews next, so I'll take Andrew Kilmister and then Andrew Coates, and then I'll invite the speakers back to reply at this point. Right, Andrew. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, uh, it's more of a sort of observation than a than a question, but I just wanted to say something briefly on behalf of um, anti-capitalist resistance, who um, are one of or the group who um, are behind resistance books about um, why we thought this book was so important to publish, and um, I think. Um, this follows on very much from what Bogdan and um, Yaroslav said. And it seems to me that what, what came out of this um, very strongly from the, the discussion is this question of the links between the national question and the social question and the democratic question. And within anti-capitalist resistance, within ACR for short, we've always argued that the national question really has to be taken seriously, as Bogdan said, and that it's not enough to see it just as some kind of um, uh, sort of veil, if you like, behind which social factors operate and something that you can just pass over to get to the, you know, the bread and butter issues of, um, of wages and, and, and labour. But on the other hand, it's not everything either. And so you have to theorise the um, the links between the national question and, and the social question. And I think that's what was really interesting in both what Bogdan was saying and what Yaroslav was saying was, was the complexity of those links. And it's something that we've always tried to highlight from ACR. And following on from that, we need also to look at the issue of imperialism and Bogdan I think gave a very good view of the the force of Russian imperialism and the need I think for the left to look not just at United States imperialism which is is the dominant imperialism still in the world today I think but also at other imperialisms and Russian imperialism is a uh, is a very important example, and we see that um, within Ukraine today. And then just finally linking up with both of those things, the issue of internationalism and the internationalism of peoples rather than states. And again, within ACR, we have always tried to emphasise the way in which you need to understand national um questions and imperialism from the perspective not just of states and the relationship between states, although those are important, but also the relationship between people and particularly between or as these factors of affect oppressed people. So I just think that, that this discussion so far has been really interesting because it it relates very much to the reasons why we wanted to publish this book. And of course, the book, as Yaroslav made clear very strongly, is not perfect. It is part of an ongoing debate. And I think what we wanted to do within ACR and within Resistance Books by publishing it is really not to say that this is the final word, but to contribute to an ongoing debate. Um, and I think the, the contributions did that really well. Thank you. Right. Can I ask Andrew Coates in next, please? Andrew, yeah. You're on mute at the moment. Can you unmute yourself? Andrew, you're on, you're on mute. Can you unmute? Yeah, I, I, I thought it's fascinating. Just a couple of points. Um, first of all, um, I really appreciate the stand of anti-capitalist, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the on this issue. But um, 
uh, not but. Um, I actually find um, it quite interesting that um, this whole thing about the um, cultural difference between Ukraine and um, Russia, you know, real historical reasons. Um, one thing I, I, I did I do find about the um, reactions to, to this is that people saying, um, you know, basically Ukrainian is, well, the same as Russian. Well, it's not. And I know a lecturer um, in um, Russian studies who um, could give you lecture and verse on this. And it's not, um, you know, it's not like, the, it's not a minor difference. And um, uh, of course, the Soviet Union was known as the Union of Soviet Republics. And of course, this is not the case at the moment. The second point, I, I just going, going back to Ukrainian history, is that um, you know it's a very very um, complicated history. One of the things I learned recently, which I didn't know before, was the amount of um, Ukrainians who were trafficked as um, slaves to the Ottoman Empire. You know, a few million actually. Anyway, just a final point. The um, the main issue at the moment is some. Um, basically defending Ukraine, which I'm glad that um, um, this particular group is um, defending. Anyway, cheerio. Anyway, thanks very much. Can I ask if other people want to speak? They could put their hands up. Um, I've got one more indication at the moment. I think I'll take that person and then um, if, there aren't, if there are a lot of others, we'll have a pause, but, when, but we'll invite the speakers back after. Right, Christopher Ford. Oh. Thank you, uh, uh, Liz. Uh, thank, and thank you to the speakers. It was really fascinating. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really great to hear Bogdan again. And uh, it's on Zuba, uh, I think I think the Zuba book is uh, was incredibly uh, still uh, revolutionary uh, in the the seventies and eighties, uh, particularly in Eastern Europe in many different ways. We used to have a. I just thought show this. Uh, this was in a, oh, I'm blurred. Uh, I wanted to show you something on the, uh, on Zuba, but I'd, I don't know how to adjust my picture. <laughs> so there we are. But we had a tiny version of Zuba, you can see here, which we used to uh, be smuggled into this, the Soviet Union in the 80s, you know, and uh, because it was banned, obviously, but it was, uh, it was still, it was incredible both there and in the West because, uh, 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 evidence the reality of the uh, how the USSR wasn't this uh, uh, happy land at all, where everyone lived equally and without dis discrimination, and Stalinism had in fact been counter-revolutionary, and that uh, this continued in a systematic and discriminatory manner. That uh, there, are, there are things about Zuba that, as well, I think we should emphasise at the time the book came out, which were incredibly important too, and that was around challenging anti-Semitism, uh, both in society and in terms of historical memory, uh, and around Babinyar, uh, which, which was mentioned, which I think is incredibly important. Uh, without the struggle of people like Zuba and the Jewish dissidents uh, at that time, who attempted to combine resistance to Russification and anti-Semitism. The, the, uh, the memory of the Holocaust uh, would simply not be the same. Uh, uh, and I think that's very important to recognise. And uh, and that also relates to Russia today. There is, a, for all the uh, abuse thrown about Ukrainian society, uh, I would argue that there's far more recognition of the Holocaust in Ukraine uh, uh, and particularly Babinya than there ever was in the Soviet Union or in or in Putin's Russia, uh, where only uh, Soviet victims were recognised. But the, there are, I think, uh, aspects of Zuba's book, the, and I, I tend to agree with uh, Yaroslav, that uh, there's contradictions. And uh, Zuba wrote a very good uh, introduction for the new edition of Marx's Capital that was due to be published, uh, which we published at, uh, on the Ukraine Solidarity website, where he points to some of these contradictions uh, that are that we can now look at today, 
uh, which he couldn't write in in the time of parting off and the restrictions where we had to only see our things through a Leninist prism or a Marxist Leninist prism, should we say. And uh, he hints at it in his book because he, he mentions the no one remembers the Borot Biste, the Ukrainian Communist Party Borot Biste. But in his introduction to Capital that's not been published, it's far clearer where he points to how the there's an entirely Ukrainian Marxist tradition which the Bolsheviks and their heirs destroyed systematically. Uh, and it was Lenin's government uh, that declared war on Ukraine in 1917, 1918, uh, and denied self-determination, uh, even though it had been overwhelmingly democratically voted for. And the Bolsheviks only got 10% of the vote in Ukraine at that time. Now, uh, the policies that were adopted in Ukraine in 1917 to 1921 were catastrophic uh, under Lenin. And, and in many ways, they contributed to undermining the social revolution in Europe by their own uh, actions. And one of those problems was this uh, problem of Russification and uh, an obsession that Lenin himself had always had uh, of, of centralism. Uh, and they, they never recognised uh, other Soviet parties. They tolerated them for a period and suppressed many of them. Uh, and they were all finally abolished. The last Ukrainian party was abolished in 1925. The last Jewish independent party was abolished in 1929. Uh, but under Lenin, that process was being carried out quite forcefully. Uh, and uh, the, that legacy... Yes, there was concessions in the 20s, which Zuba celebrates hugely. There were concessions, it was cultural autonomy, but there was no actual pluralism or function and democracy in Ukraine under Lenin. Uh, that doesn't come over in Zuba, but he does recognise it later, uh, uh, of how they basically waged a war against the Marxists in Ukraine, uh, in a war, war of conquest, and I think that's important and that we are free to examine all that. And uh, there's other works by Ukrainian Marxists from this period that, that should be published again. They're available in, available in English, including Bolsheviks, who were having their books banned in Ukraine in the revolutionary period, uh, who were being forcibly exiled uh, uh, in that period. And uh, uh, another point that Zuba does outline too, which uh, Yaroslav mentioned, was the the problems of the national movement when it revived in the 80s. Uh, I, the, the, their failure to succeed in uh, championing the workers, and he's praising Marx's ideas in this, but uh, there's a degree in which I have to say I don't think they had a lot of time to build. Uh, I mean, the, the founding congress of the Rook, and just by coincidence, I, I looked it out, which was the the national movement in the, in the late 80s, did have a, as its platform that we stand for the peasants becoming the owners of the land and the workers of the of the industrial enterprises, but the uh, but that that was uh, only they were only set up at the end of nineteen eighty nine and uh, and very soon we had the Stalinist bureaucracy seizing control of the independent Ukraine and privatizing etc. Uh, but the it, it, Ukraine followed very similar path as other East European countries in terms of how the the Stalinist bureaucracy became essentially neoliberal dogmatists and uh, other ideas were sidelined. Uh, but I I do think, I, I don't think it was entirely the fault of Rook and the national movement uh, that they, that failed to develop because I do think there was a, it was a, there was a question of context and the rapidity of the process that they failed to fully uh, develop. And uh, but it should be emphasised that the working class played a big role in achieving independence in in that period, eighty nine, ninety one, particularly the coal miners, uh, on a, and uh, but the uh, uh, you know, and even though I'm making this criticism of uh, Zuba and uh, of the the Leninist prism that he adopts, I uh, I still think it's incredibly valuable, and uh, I think it's a big problem in Ukraine today. The uh, from the people who run national memory, like Mr. Vichovich and others, that they have a. Uh, sought to completely sideline all those achievements of the Ukrainian Marxists, of Ukrainian social democracy, of Ukrainian socialism, 
which were the founders of the Ukrainian national movement in the 19th century and brought about the rebirth of Ukraine in 1917. Uh, and instead, the, we have counterposed to it a completely exaggerated and dogmatic and falsified uh, image of Stepan Bandera and the 1930s, 1940s nationalists uh, to the detriment of everything else. So in a recovering Zuba, is in many ways a contribution to recovering that history, uh, that, that true history of the Ukrainian movement. Thank you very much. Right. I don't think I see any further indications of speakers, so you just make a, a few comments and then invite the speakers back and then invite Fred back, Fred, in to say something about the work of the Ukraine Solidarity Campaign. We've had some very interesting questions, I think, posed in the discussion. The question of the psychology of people who themselves were Ukrainian but actually we're engaged in policies enforcing Russification on the Ukrainian population. We've had questions about what attitudes people on the left should take to the to questions of internationalism and imperialism, how they see the national question, what significance it has. I think that's a very important question because I think many of us coming from oppressor nations, you know, just see national identity as something to get rid of, really, or something that would just wither away. Um, or it was, just, it was just an event of the 19th century. You know, so I think there are these questions about how the left should view the national question, which are really important. I think there's some really important things raised about the um, cultural um, differences between the two countries and how significant they are, and how we explain that between Russia and Ukraine, how we see those in terms of the history. And I think... Uh, Christopher has mentioned many aspects of history, but uh, the importance of you know respecting and recognizing the Ukrainian socialist and Marxist traditions, and uh, perhaps has also suggested we really should be looking for some more books to publish. Maybe this book will be one of a series. That's obviously, I think, a suggestion that's here. Um, so, can I ask the, the speakers back to, for about five minutes each if they'd like to come in and make any more comments? Um, so, I'll take Bodan first if you'd like to come in for a few more minutes. To reply to some of the points in the debate. Please. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, just a number of quick uh, factual comments about the, the business about Sherbitsky and all of that. Uh, Sherbitsky was the, the chairman of the Council of Ministers. The head of the Communist Party of Ukraine at that time was Shellist. And actually, Shellist was removed on the grounds of nationalism because he tried, um, he, 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 under, under Shellist, very interesting things were beginning to happen. There was a 50% increase in the number of Ukrainian books published. And he, for example, it's under him that for those who thought that Ukraine was a language uh, that was impossible, that had lexicon, lexical, had a weak lexicon and, and couldn't complex, publish complex stuff. Ukraine put out the three volume encyclopedia of cybernetics in Ukrainian only and eventually a Russian thing. So, um, the, the, the reason why we're flying drones very well is because way back then we had a strong institute of cybernetics that, that did that. Look, you have to remember that Russification is not a policy that anybody in the Ukrainian in power developed. It was a policy that was done in that was done in Moscow. The um, the U Ukrainians' level of autonomy was not very strong. The KGB was directly controlled from the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Ukraine did not decide its own fate. I think also one has to situate what Zuba was doing. He was making an argument about why you don't, why you have to stop Russification and, 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 and the national question within the framework of the ideology that was acceptable to his audience. He couldn't take it outside that. And so hence his extensive references to Leninist policy and all of that. Um, you know, I mean, Len, 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 the, the way the Bolsheviks came to power in Ukraine, as I mentioned, was that they came to power. It took them three times to take power. It was by force. And the first thing they did when they came to power 
is to take away the land from the peasants and resulted in a huge peasant uprisings. And the reason why things changed was because of what Christopher Ford said. There was the power of the left-wing social revolutionaries, the Borodbiste. And this is a, a very interesting group that uh, needs to be noted. In general, I think the, there is a really the, the the left has to the left has to work and develop something uh, develop something new make new statements. I think that there is a, this, this first of all, if you're looking for legacies, there are wonderful legacies of left wing Ukrainian social democratic uh, uh, social democratic thinking, uh, be, beginning with Rahulmanov on. And uh, it's not dominated by what, what Lenin said. And by the way, Lenin, by, by the time of his death, realized that he had created a monster and that the bureaucrats were these, you know, uh, uh, r r Russian bureaucrats were exhibiting all of their great Russian chauvinist traditions. And he was very worried about that. But that's another story. He, Zuba, of course, was not, a, he was not particularly left wing. If he were living in Britain, he'd be somewhere in the center or whatever of the Labour Party, uh, the kind of person who would go out on, on the demonstrations and support it. Neither is he a political philosopher. He's, um, he, he, he's, he's, a cult he's a cultural figure, but he was a person always with a social conscience. And, it, and these things bothered him. And it's, it's, it's very true that Ruth missed a very big opportunity at that time uh, because there was extensive involvement of workers, um, the, with the, when the Arsenal uh, workers of Arsenal came out, it, it was a very, it was quite important. I've written the piece about uh, this uh, the, 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 this period. Um, I think it's a question of. I, I think also you national identity is a complex thing. And it's it's deeper than language. You just ask the Irish. They speak English, but, but they're Irish. You know, Bernard Shaw said the Irish and the English are separated by the same language. I think there is a general revulsion. It's not just a question of speaking Russian or whatever. There's a revulsion of what the social formation represents, that Putin represents, that whole package of the Russian world, with autocracy, kleptocracy, uh, run by run by the run by the secret police, and they don't want any part of that world, and that world is constantly uh, constantly broadcasting and attacking them, and it's a tr it's a basic civilizational choice. Um, they want to live in a state where you have elections. Where there is a, a, you know, you don't you, you don't get arrested for 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 dissent, and of course they are in the process of discovering their identity. One of the most remarkable things is happening now is the boom in Ukrainian pub, Ukrainian language publishing, absolute revulsion against 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 the Russian world because it doesn't stand for any value. There are no values of any, of, of, of any substance. And they begin to realize what, 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 a, what a cesspool that is. And they don't want any of it. And very many people today in Ukraine who, um, very many people today in Ukraine who wrote, spoke Russian, uh, at home are switching to Ukrainian. But, but, but you can be a Ukrainian patriot as the boys on the, and girls on the on the front line who who communicate in Russian uh, amongst themselves understand the 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 the, 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 the notion the political the political nation the the notion of Ukraine is not just language it's a system it's a society it's a type of society that allows you to build and you will only be be able to build that society if you are independent you. And it's those those things about society that need to be developed. I think uh, the left yet has to develop, I, from what I can see in Ukraine, any kind of, apart from discussing social problems, 
but there is a there is no sort of deeper uh, deeper and uh, deeper analysis um nor is there an eff- an, uh, an effort of any consequence to develop uh, to develop a political party and i i i you know some of the biggest patriots in ukraine are russian speaking it's more complicated than that Thank you very much for that point. That's a very interesting one, right? Right, can I invite Yaroslav in then? Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I'll start with a question about psychology then. Um, I think, first of all, that the Communist Party was not was a huge organization. There were people with different uh, uh, opinions, sometimes more uh, critical, and then they ended up <laughs> excluded from the... Communist Party, but those who were career oriented definitely were willing to follow any orders from the, the center, Moscow, especially those whose formative years were during Stalinist period, where you can pay your life for deviating from the, or not even deviating, but ended up just uh, the wrong place and wrong time. So that's actually the time when both Shellest and Sherbitsky. Shellest, the guy who is at the moment of, like the book was published and to whom it was like addressed partially. And Sherbitsky, the guy who replaced Shellest as more obedient to Moscow part uh, Ukrainian party boss. So like Shellest was definitely more like seemed like uh, more Ukrainian like oriented uh towards uh like ner- um, nurturing some Ukrainian culture, its development, where Shubitsky didn't seem care that much, rather about his uh, party career and uh, relations with uh, higher ups. So, yes, and uh, how the left should uh, think about national question? I think that's something that uh, I don't know some of the answers, at least part of the. Uh, start of the discussion could be found in the second international where Lenin started, where I think uh, for me, some of the kind of less appreciated thought is by Austro-Marxists like uh, Otto Bauer and Karl Renner, who were thinking about uh, national autonomy, uh, like personal national autonomy, that's kind of thinking a bit out of the box, that's not necessarily should be like national blocks that we have like nation state but we have many minorities and we can think about it addressing their rights extraterritorial not necessarily think about them in that regard that i think one way that we can dig deeper or if we want to go into ukrainian uh, tradition something that also kind of bugs me and i uh, want to <laughs> this reason want to learn german partially that there is a great ukrainian marxist Marxist thinker Roman Rozdolsky, who is unfortunately not that known or translated, but he also takes on connection between a national question and how it developed in socialism and social and uh, capitalism. I think that could be uh, also something that uh, we you know may dig up and help us think about that. Uh, question about relations between social question and national question because i think that often in t- such situation like ukraine those things come together you cannot take only social question address or only national question that actually partially was my my critique of duba maybe i was unfair expecting from the guy who was a first of all literary scholar not a big philosopher that he will develop some kind of Critical theory, at least, not I'm not talking about political program, but he played very important historical role, and uh, that role that he played created maybe some expectations. Yeah, but yes, what I'm saying that um, want to sum up answering the question about connection between national and social question that it always will be context dependent, and uh, we should be very attentive to every situation where uh, there is national struggle and also social struggle and how those things connect because often they can be very different relations in those questions. So, yeah, I won't bother you more with my talking. 
Right. Thank you both very much. I'd like to thank the speakers. I, I realise it's maybe very difficult hours for you doing this talk and so on. Um, before we finish, we have a couple of things. Uh, first of all, there's a note in the chat that Sasha Ishmael's put reminding people about an appeal of the Ukraine Solidarity Campaign running to support rescue workers in Donetsk. And so please can you make a note of that? And before we finish, um, I can remind you about the meeting on the 9th about the book on Palestine. We can also call Fred Laplatin to tell us a bit about what's happening in the Ukraine Solidarity Campaign. Over to, over to you, Fred. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for a very interesting uh, and fascinating uh, um, discussion. And thanks to Bodan for um, passing on his his memories of Dubla. I think it's important to um, to to have that um, you know history uh, carried on. Um, and you know, I helped publish the book, and uh, you know, I thought I thought um, it's a fascinating book, first of all. But also, I think the his speech at Babinyar is is really full of humanity. <laughs> and and uh, internationalism uh and a lesson for many people today still in the world um so thanks thanks for Bodan for helping uh for allowing us to use his uh original introduction for this book anyway just a few things about ukraine solidarity campaign of of which i'm involved with as a chair and chris is here as a secretary as well um and chris has been running the campaign since 2014 when um, Russia invaded uh, uh, Crimea, and uh, this current phase of the war um, is, is I think, think it's an ongoing phase. Um, is is absolutely disastrous, and we've that's why we've we've relaunched over the last couple of years the Ukraine Solidarity Campaign um, to push for international solidarity with the people of Ukraine in their struggle against occupation and annexation, and for self determination. These should be absolutely basic things for leftists for socialists for democrats for internationalists and uh that's the that's the purpose of the ukraine solidarity campaign and um although the beginnings were a little bit difficult uh because unfortunately some people on the left said oh well you know is the great big uh, evil empire of um, the united states is um is involved there and we just can't possibly take sides in this um in this campaign it's just an imperialist front we say definitely well Whatever the motivations of the US or Britain, for us it's a question of solidarity with the people of Ukraine, and in particular solidarity with the trade unions, the leftist movements, the progressive feminist organisations, and so on and so forth, who do exist in so in in Ukraine, um, and um, so we've been helping put these voices of uh, 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 trade unionists and leftists and progressives uh, outside of Ukraine and in Britain. And uh, as a result of that, uh, we've been getting speakers from the trade unions or th through Chris and so on to speak at uh, trade union conferences in Britain. And now we've got the affiliations of some major unions, the, the PCS, uh, College Lecturers Union, of which Liz is a member and a past president, um, Unison, the, one of the biggest unions in Britain, um, the, the Rail Workers Union, National Union of Mine Workers, and so on. And um, that's very important to show that um, the solidarity is not is 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 actually between the working class with the working class in Ukraine and between progressive forces, uh, leftist forces, socialists with their respective numbers in uh, the, the opposite organisations in in Ukraine. And it's quite basic what we're saying: it's uh, against occupation and annexation for self determination for the Ukrainian people. They have the right to defend themselves, and for that they should be able to get the arms um, necessary to do the job without conditions. Uh, in the knowledge also that um, some countries in the West who are reluctant to provide arms don't provide enough of them. Some countries want to uh, restore trade relations with Russia. Others just want to carry on and weaken Russia. But nevertheless, um, we are you know fully behind the, uh, 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 the the arms struggle of the people of Ukraine to defend themselves, and we don't do that um, necessarily uncritically. You know, I mean, we're also calling for the debt in. In in of of Ukraine to be cancelled so that there can be a reconstruction for for social and economic justice uh, without neoliberalism uh, uh, without uh, um, and without neoliberal reforms which unfortunately have been pushed through in in Ukraine um, 
by the current government. But um, notwithstanding that, our solidarity is still unconditional and uh, we will can carry on doing that. So there's a few things that, you know, if you are in Britain, you can do is join the Ukraine Solidarity Campaign. If you're in Scotland as well, there's a there's a Ukraine Solidarity uh, uh, Scotland group there. Uh, you can find them on Facebook and on our website. Uh, give money to the fund drive for giving uh, uh, for buying aid, which we get in here in Britain and which is transported um, to Ukraine by volunteer drivers, including Chris, uh, to Ukraine and donated directly to uh, trade unions or organisations that need that. At the moment, it's, a, it's the rescue equipment for uh, 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 one of the mining unions um, in, in the Donbass region. So I think that's, that's all I have to say. Join donate um buy the book buy the buy the book it's a fascinating book even though it was written 50 years ago uh, some people on the left or to uh, who don't support ukraine uh, should uh, could do well in, in reading it uh, along, along with some of the other um books that resistance books has produced which give a voice to ukrainians um i'll leave it at that and thanks everybody for coming and i hope you'll support the ukrainian solidarity campaign thank you Thank you very much. And thank you very much to our speakers and to everyone who's contributed. I hope you'll find it an interesting meeting. As I said, there is a meeting on the 9th about Palestine. Um, and please do, you know, keep buying books and resistance books. And um, please do also give us ideas about other books we should be producing in future, because that's clearly one of the important takeaways of tonight's discussion. So I say thank you very much to everyone. I think it's now time to close the meeting. But thank you all very much. And thank you to our speakers. Keep, keep up the good work.